Good afternoon, Bait Midrash folks. Welcome back. Uh, glad to have y'all here. Glad to be learning together and uh, glad to uh, be jumping into Parshat Shmini together, uh, which contrary to its name is not the eighth Parsha in Torah. Putting it out there. But um, yeah, I will say that he did not go, Rabbi Sachs did not go where I thought he was going to go. When I opened, I'm like, Parshat Shmini, I know what he's going to talk about. And he did it. So I was impressed with that. But uh, what was some feedback, comments, thoughts that y'all had on uh, on this Parsha? <clears throat> Okay, I gave y'all 30 seconds. That wasn't 30 <laughs> seconds. That was like 10, but go ahead. <laughs> no, I'll wait. Stuart wasn't counting out loud this time, so I didn't get to... <laughs> He was counting by five. It was fine. Um, uh, um, go, Barbara. Well, Stuart, you mentioned imposter syndrome, and we were talking about health insurance, and two guys in this partial that really needed health insurance were Aaron's sons, <laughs> and Abihu. And I wondered about the situation. Um, it's where he's talking about imposter syndrome. Maybe sometimes imposters aren't really imposters. Maybe they really have an issue. And so um, it's talking about the hesitation that Moses had, the hesitation that Aaron had. And I would think that Aaron's hesitations weren't that confusing because he'd already done something he was trying to work out and ended up with the situation of the golden calf. So it doesn't surprise me that he would be hesitant to jump right in and try leading and leading on his own, et cetera. Are so you saying Aaron, Moses should, Moses's uh, objections are less valid? Well, look what happened to somebody who, or two people, two sons, that went ahead and did something because they were enthusiastic. They thought they were I mean, yes, they made a mistake. We know that 2020, I mean, hindsight is 2020. We know what happens when this stuff, you know, when mistakes happen. And Rabbi Sachs is talking about it's natural to make mistakes. And I think our mistakes lead us to hold back, lead us to hesitate to jump in. So imposter syndrome and maybe Stuart knows a whole lot or actually this is Margaret's territory knows a whole lot more about imposter syndrome than and can clarify that for me but I thought imposter syndrome um you know allowed you to be fearful of stepping in and doing something it's not imposter syndrome it's common sense it's i don't want to get hurt i don't want to do the wrong thing i don't think that's imposter syndrome that, yeah no but he makes it imposter syndrome he explains why they didn't want to do things why they didn't want to be leaders because they thought they had issues with being leaders, whatever their issues were I mean, if it's stuttering, um, yeah, not to go on to topic two, but I really don't understand what uncircumcised lips are either. Um, where Exodus 6, 12, Moses says, why should Pharaoh listen to me? This is the bottom of page 141. I have uncircumcised lips. Margaret, do you want to tackle the imposter? Like, are you, I think the question, if I'm understanding Barbara, is whether or not he's defining imposter syndrome correctly with these particular characters. I, it seems to me that there is, there's something to be said on, on, on either side. Um, and both of the, that is to say, um, from the beginning, you know, I mean, from the beginning, 
Moses felt that he was unworthy for the tasks that were allotted him. And he continued, even in the face of, um, even in the face of evidence of, of success, um, to to feel unworthy at times, and I think that that is that is pretty characteristic of a, of imposter syndrome. In the case of Aaron, um, I think is somewhat different. Um, uh, I was very glad to hear, hear, by the way, because I'd been fretting about what was going to happen. What why Aaron never never got any punishment for his uh, behavior with the golden calf and. Uh, so Rabbi Sachs uh, um, provides an explanation. I think in the case of Aaron, there's no evidence from the beginning. I mean, at the beginning, he was quite willing to to do what um, was asked of him, and there isn't hasn't been any evidence, to my recollection, up until now that um, uh, that he had any hesitation. Whereas, um, whereas here, um, he did he had done the wrong thing. Um, and so that would make him um, perhaps more likely to be hesitant um, to take on additional responsibilities. So I see the two. I see the two men as 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 somewhat as somewhat different cases. What do you think, others or Rabbi? Or... So Margaret, let me ask you this. Um, it seems to me that some imposter syndrome people experience this because of external effects like I, th I think Moses was called by God to do what he did I mean he didn't ask for it he was right. called yeah. to yeah. do it and so then he says why me why should I am I really qualified to do this Aaron I think to a certain extent may be similar um so it's those these external things but to me, I've been around academia enough to see a lot of highly successful academic people, and I'd be interested in what Barbara has to say about this, who um, are very are high achievers. I mean, they're very smart, and they get a lot accomplished academically, but they, they do have this internal angst. Yeah. It's related to their own internal feelings that they've created in themselves as opposed to being called by God to go do something. So I'd be interested in your comments on the external versus internal and Barbara's on uh, what she's seen in academia related to uh, imposter syndrome. Well, in, in a way that external, I don't know, I'm, I'm just winging it here, but in a way I'm not- Aren't we all? Convinced about the external internal only in the sense that um, Oh boy, that that thought flashed through my mind so fast and went out the other side. Let me say something for a minute, Mark, <laughs> while ahead. you collect those thoughts. And Christine could also talk about academic experience with this, but I, I guess I've always fallen into the trap of thinking they're just so one track minded that they only, you know, they only know their own stuff and that's it. So, I mean, and that's the first thing that comes to my mind. So to really answer your question, uh, Stuart or Barbara Royal, whoever you are today, um, <laughs> Stuart, I would say that, I mean, I haven't done any, any particular notice of this. Some of these academic people are too close to me. I wouldn't dare say why they do this, why they do this. Just, you know, I think that, uh, it's possible that some people get very wrapped up in a uh, very small amount of things they want to focus on. So they're really experts in a very narrow field of sorts. Right. Which right. makes it them, but then they have to be, they have to take on other like teaching responsibilities, things that are outside their immediate. Yeah. And it's tough then they to feel the inadequate. When you're really thinking about something different, it's tough to remember to bring your wife flowers when you're what do you think, Christine? Well, uh, I've been in academia now for 20 years. Ha! Huh! Wow, that's, that's hard to believe. Um, and, you know, it's interesting. I remember my shrink in grads, graduate school introducing me to the idea of a, imposter syndrome because I was struggling with it even then. 
and um, and my current shrink says she sees it all the time in her practice, especially in women in academia in particular. Um, I mean, I can't speak for others, but you know, when I, I I'd been here for thirteen years when I applied for the the associate dean for the honors college position, and, and I was certain I wouldn't get it. I had I, I was like, what's the point of even applying? And and through the entire process, um, I remember running into one of the other candidates on his way out of the interview and thinking, ah, crap, there's no way I'm going to get this job. And here I am, <laughs> associate dean for five years. And um, I don't know. I don't know if it's if it's an issue of um, being siloed, as has been implied here, that, you know, that we just have a narrow focus. Um, mm -hmm. I think, actually, that in academia, what we spend our whole lives doing is learning how to think, and that is cross-applied in a multitude of ways. And certainly everything I did as an opera director had much more application to me being an associate dean than I ever thought it would. You know, I manage people, I manage problems, I put out fires, I manage personalities. The sum of the, the whole is always greater than the sum of the parts. It's all the same stuff. Just because I'm a musician doesn't mean I can't do other things. I don't know. Is that completely off topic? I don't even know if I answered the question. No, I, I think I think it does in a way because I think what we're saying is you didn't like do some catastrophic, horrible thing like right before you got promoted and then, you know, then we're feeling like I'm not worthy of this. And I think that's where we are with Aaron. He basically, you know, basically failed and then <laughs> was basically then kind of promoted and feeling like a fraud. Yeah. So, yeah. you know, I can definitely, I definitely see that. But at first I thought it was going to be the case where it would have been, I thought he was going to say it was his, well, he did, he did say that it was his opportunity to um, kind of redeem himself in a way. Um, but at the same time, it was also, I don't want to say punishment, but it was his, um, his, he should have been the one, if anyone was going to be the one to be the representative for the sin that had been committed, mm. I guess you could say. As I, as I recall, we only see Aaron expressing any self-doubts that one time. If, I mean, we, whereas Moses expresses self-doubts from the moment that he is called by God repeatedly, repeatedly, um, he, he says, I, you know, I can't really do this. Um, I'm not really up to this. Um, you've got, you know, you got you you got the wrong guy um and um so to me he's more representative of an imposter syndrome but it's certainly certainly i have seen that i've felt that at times you know when i felt the you know somebody tells me oh you're such a good psychologist and then all i can think of is the all the the, the people that i didn't didn't help or if i could think you know back if I you know, could re redo things with them I I would have. Um but I also I think that his character I've seen it in in lots and lots of of people that 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 I have worked with professionally who were primarily as 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 Sack says pretty uh pretty high achieving people. Um, who nevertheless um, were doubtful of their of, of their of their abilities, or that they deserved the um, accolades. Um, yeah, I, I had a I had a thought, and I'm dating myself a little here, 
of uh, old Wayne's World. Do you guys ever see like the Wayne's World skits on Saturday Night Live? Like, we're not worthy. We're not worthy, right? Like, <laughs> that's the imposter syndrome, right? Is we're not worthy to be getting whatever it is we're getting. Um, and, you know, uh, we, those who were part of the Bait Midrash last year, we looked at, you know, Gadushat Levi on Parshat Shmot, who says, like, Moses says, Who am I that I should go to Pharaoh? I'm just some, little old shepherd who's tending my father-in-law's flocks in Midian. Who am I that, and I have, I can't even speak well. I'm not articulate. I can't talk. I have a speech impediment, whatever it is. Anybody but me. I'm not worthy to go stand before who at the time was probably the most powerful person in the world. Who am I that I should go stand before him? What's God's response? at least according to Reb Levi Yitzchak of Berdichev, that attitude is exactly why I'm choosing you. Is because as a leader, you need to have some of that humility of saying, I know I'm not perfect. I know I'm not the right person. I know I'm not everything I can be. But you got to do something. Um, and I think, you know, I do think, Rabbi, I think we're a. I think we're getting a little caught up in the technical terminology of his of the imposter syndrome, and missing, I think, a little bit of Rabbi Sachs' larger point, which is things that are making us feel insecure are exactly the things that are the reason that we're we're doing what we're doing. Moses's insecurity about being a good leader, being able to speak, being able to be articulate is exactly why God chose him. Aaron's insecurity of how can I go serve God when I'm responsible for the greatest sin that our people have ever done in history is exactly why he needs to be the one doing it. Um, I'm not sure I love his verbiage of your greatest weakness can become, if you wrestle with it, your greatest strength. I'm not sure I love that verbiage. But I think he's on to something in that it's the things that make us insecure that give us the ability to be much better at the jobs that we do. And you can only, I mean, the things that make your, that build your self-esteem are not just sitting around doing the stuff that uh, that's easy for you. you yes. Know? I tell I tell every bar and bat mitzvah student that is that you know I I don't have a format I don't say like these are the things you have to do as a bar and bat mitzvah I say you know I want you to do this I want you to do that and I want you to do what you feel like you can do and then some I want to push you beyond a little bit beyond what you think you can do because that's the only way you ever grow in life not by staying within what you're comfortable doing, but by pushing yourself a little beyond that. Yes, Laura? You can just chime um, in. Yeah, I, I, this isn't class. Well, it, it, the, you know, the, the speaking on, on Zoom when you two people talk. But I, what I was thinking more of was that um, when you give someone power and, and uh, to think that you had the power of God would have been great, great power. So you needed someone with great humility. And so I, I think that's a little bit more of what it's talking about. I mean, in today's world, you can look at Trump, who is taking the position that he's God appointed and he's wanting to have total power and, you know, thinks that he's, fine to to wield that um because he's just you know right about everything so if you take somebody and give them great power which for instance the presidency of the united states that if they don't have humility that they're going to become a tyrant just because you know absolute power corrupts 
the end. <laughs> and there was a paragraph in the in the reading that speaks exactly to what you're saying, and I'm sure that that uh, it was the book was published in 2020, so I'm assuming that it had uh, um, some direct meaning where he talks about the person who's who you know can get up in front of crowds and 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 entertain them and push them around and so on and so forth this uh, versus the person who stammers um that the, the one who's going to stand up in front of crowds and push and and display that 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 kind of uh, um I, I don't know what the word is. I forget. But anyhow, is is exactly the person that you, that you don't want, and somebody with the, who stammers is the person who do, who you do want. <clears throat> I say I I will not directly say anything because I'm not endangering our five hundred one c three status, um, <laughs> and I'm not going to say much else either because I have a high holiday sermon planned around the election. So I'm gonna, mm -hmm. I don't want to no spoiling. You know, I don't want to, I still want you guys to come on the high holiday, right? So I can't tell you my sermon now and then have <laughs> you guys not show up. I need you guys to show up. So uh, <laughs> teaser, like teaser trailer right there. Uh, okay. For, what's, I'm, I'm ignorant. What do you mean by 503C status? Non uh, nonprofit non tax exempt status. So he's not supposed to be political. Right. Well, I cannot I cannot endorse or um degrade a individual candidate. I cannot use my position as the leader of this organization to endorse or denigrate a particular candidate. <laughs> Although there are plenty of tax exempt people who do just that. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I mean a lot of the churches <laughs> feel like that's their job. Yeah. Right. Kind of yeah setting well, yeah um, but I have to agree I have to agree with Margaret and, and Laura you know I, I am highly suspicious of anyone who wants to take a leadership position who claims that they have all the answers and that they are the only right person to do it I, that is usually a huge red flag for me I say right. the 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 teaser for my one of my high holiday sermons is along the lines of beware of people who seek out power. Right. The, the you look at most of our tradition, it's the people who don't seek out power who end up being the best leaders. Um, so beware of those who are seeking additional power, because that's usually those people tend not to end up um, doing good things in our tradition. Gosh, when are the high holidays? I believe the First night of Rosh Hashanah, I believe, is October 1st. Are you going to let us know ahead of time which night we should come in to hear the rest of the sermon? No. <laughs> <laughs> you got to come to all of them, and that way you know which one oh, you won't miss it. <laughs> oh, man, I want a position of power so that I can tell you which night is convenient for me to show up. <laughs> <laughs> Well, I'm so glad that we got around to my point because I was carefully ignored all the time I had my hand up. I'm glad we got around to it. Thank you. I'm looking at where you guys are. <laughs> yes, TK. Um, I'm a, I'm a little. I think that the, the the idea of people having doubts about themselves in itself is quite interesting. And, you know, I, I feel like an imposter all the time. <clears throat> Y'all excuse my gravelly throat. Um, but, but it's, I think part of it is because we walk around without really access to what I'll call the deep mind, your deep mind, which you, which is, your whole mind, your whole mind, body, whatever that is, which could be a whole other conversation. 
but we go around with just our conscious minds available to us until we we need something and it pulls up. And so many times I'll go like I'm I have a big talk coming up tomorrow, and I have I really am, have not been able to focus on knowing what I'm going to say, and I have to kind of trust that I know that it'll come when I want it because that's what it does. And that, so I do feel like an imposter when I stand up. And then these words come out, and I'm like, where the hell did they come from? And I don't know. And I, I think people who assume they know things when they really are walking around not knowing. And it, it's the same kind of thing that we talked about before about artists, musicians, writers, uh, painters, whatever, the medium, that that it feels when you get in the groove of it, when you are, are expressing yourself, you don't know where it comes from, you being the conscious mind. Yeah, I think somebody, <laughs> somebody was telling me recently that they saw some research that I think it imagined the mind as an iceberg. Yes. And where most of the, where I think they said five to 8% of our mind workings are actually conscious, which means if I do the math correctly, which is not my strong suit, 95 to 98%, no, 92 to 95% of what our minds are doing are subconscious. Like we're not really aware of what what's going on. I don't think, well, it, like yeah, I don't think it's even just the mind. You know, I mean, I I think we think you know I think what's going on in the body also um, uh, is I mean I don't mean the obvious things like you know we can't feel our stomach digesting most of the time or something like that I mean that uh, you know the the things that are going on in our body affect things going on in our minds in ways that that we're not that we're not that we're not conscious that we, that we right. are not conscious of. that's part of the iceberg that's under the water yeah. yeah yeah but it is but it in a what in a way that feels kind of strange when we think about it that is us so you can tr you know you can stand up to do something and just you know you can i think if you I'm just going to trust God to speak through me or whatever. And it ha it it happens or it, it appears to happen. It feels like an external something is running through you. Or you can just say, I'm going to trust my subconscious to come up with, you know, to digest and have have some way of speaking this ideas in in a way that will it will be understandable and be meaningful to other people. Even though right right before it comes out of my mouth, I have no idea what it is. I say there's a Hasidic Rebbe, um, the Maori Naim from Chernobyl. Some of you I think have heard me say this before, who if you look through his book, there's some partiote where there's no commentary. So I I asked one of my teacher, you know, teachers, why is there no commentary? And they said so it's kind of interesting. What would happen, he was a little unique in this, is that he would give his drosh on Saturday afternoon. His students would kind of remember it. And then after Shabbat, they'd write it down. That's kind of normal. But he, the Chernobyl Rebbe would want to look it over before, it got, before they, after they wrote it down. If he remembered saying it, he would tell them to burn it. Because it was his, because he was the one saying it. it what, whereas if he didn't remember saying it, then God was speaking through him and he was just the conduit and the vehicle right. through which God was delivering the message. But if he remembered saying it, that means he was coming up with it himself and they should just burn it, which is why there's some partiotes that are burned because he, yeah. he, he remembered saying it. He's like, can't publish it. It has to be God's word, not mine. That is very interesting. Right. <laughs> I just think of, you know, my own senility and uh, that's quite hilarious. <laughs> well, I mean, that's a possibility too, is that he just didn't remember saying it, but then it was yeah, fine. <laughs> I mean, you know, I mean, 
um, kind of takes the focus off of his memory problem. <laughs> well, TK, I have to say I am in awe of you because, because um, I have had that experience. I've had that, that experience a bunch of times. But I don't think I could trust myself to get up in front of a group of people um, and and believe that I'm gonna I'm gonna have that experience today. Well, it's either that or write down every single word and read it, mm -hmm. or maybe have some notes or something. But I tend to kind of wander around, so. <laughs> I think well, part, maybe of, I, part of that maybe. is that she knows her subject matter so well that she can just start talking and, you know, which way it goes. Otherwise, she'll get too bored with her same speech every time. She's well, maybe I can make herself, a physician. Right? Well, I'm sorry. Make a physician comment. You know, um, I think a lot of some of what we're talking about today is uncertainty whether you're certain or uncertain about what your capabilities are in a certain dimension. Uh, you know, patients come in to see physicians and they want to know the diagnosis. What's wrong with me, doctor, right? And they want your, you, you are happiest when you feel like your doctor is certain that, mm -hmm. that you have XYZ problem. In fact, Un, you know, medicine is all, diagnosis is all statistics. I mean, if you're, 95% com uh, accurate in making a diagnosis, that means that 5% of the time you're wrong or it's something else. But you have to project yourselves as being 100% confident when you can at most be 95% confident. So there's a, as to the residents that I teach, I usually tell them, use this dictum, often in air, never in doubt. <laughs> often in air, never in doubt. And so that, that will save you at least your concept of yourself, your your insecurities and uncertainties in yourself. Very so, well. And that, I think that's hard for us to do generally is to have is to live with that uncertainty. There's it's it's unsettling, right? To not know what's to not know what the answer is, to not know that what we're doing is the right thing to deal with it, to deal with just, am I worthy? Um, you know, you know, as a doctor, you know, you, you learn a lot to actually know it, right? Like, you, sure, you read it in a book, but, you know, who are you to look at this person and actually know what it is? Yeah. Um, and be and know it well enough that you can heal them right um well there's you know, the there's, the si there's the science of medicine which we learn in medical school and there is the art of medicine right. which we learn somewhat in school but i think you learn over your practice and over your life about how to be a better artist and not just a scientist and you know, I think a little bit to Margaret's point before, you know, yes, Moses, particularly at the beginning, comes off as very like, you know, they didn't listen to me. I told you they weren't going to listen to me. Um, you know, I'm not worthy. I can't do this. I can't do this by myself. Um, over time, he gets a little, as as his he gets into it, he he grows as a leader. He he gets a little more certain. He gets a little more experience. He gets a little more into it. And he does a pretty good job. Um, same thing with Aaron. Aaron is a little, you know, uncertain here. But, you know, once he walks into the role, he does a great job. Um, and I think that's I think that's a little bit what Stuart's talking about too, right? Is that, you know, there's some uncertainty at the beginning. That's fine. But with the experience, you get more confidence as you gain more experience doing it. And do you ever feel like less of an imposter? Um, I don't know, but you know, you at least have a little more confidence in what you're doing. 
I think when, I, when you're I, in, I'm sorry. Go ahead. Sorry. Well, I was just going to say, I think when you are in, I call it the flow. It's got lots of names. When you're doing it, and maybe perhaps when Moses was actually speaking with God's words or what he believed was God's words, you're, the imposter syndrome kind of falls away in that moment. The imposter syndrome is when you're not doing and you reflect on it. You say, how do I, how could I have done that? Or you do, you make do a painting and then you look at it and you go, I did that. How, I have no idea how I did that. Therefore, I must not really be able to do that, which is, you know, is, is not true. You did or whatever you is, something did it inside of you. Um, so, it, it, I think Moses probably when he was in the in the act of speaking and confronting Pharaoh, he probably did not have doubts at that moment. It was afterwards when he went, "What the heck did I just do?" That that in that space where you don't, you're not feeling those things, they're not coming out. Um, probably, Stuart, I would I would guess that when you have decided that this is, you know, I have a 95% accuracy that this is what it is. And when you're communicating that in the art of being a doctor to your patients, you're not experiencing imposter syndromes. Maybe afterwards when you go, what if I'm wrong? How, do, how am I going to deal with it? That's when it comes upon you. And I, I think those, this, I think there are those 5% of times that you're wrong where you really feel that the strongest. And I think where mm -hmm. Rabbi Sachs is trying to say is that's okay. And that use those times when you're feeling most insecure, wrestle with it so that you can gain better understanding. Um, Another thing that Rabbi Sachs says that works well with this is that when you've made mistakes, you're better able to he help others who maybe have made the same mistakes or are likely to make similar mistakes. It makes you someone who can be more qualified, but not only qualified, but more able to assist others in the same situation. Empathy, and you're open to sorry. You're you're open to the possibility of being wrong, mm -hmm. which is important. And and you maybe perhaps, for example, you might uh, when I started writing my latest book, I was like, I don't know anything. So I better really dig into this and get to a point where I do, because I know I don't. If I'd started writing, writing and just said, well, I'm just going to wing it on what I think I know. It, it would not have had the, the, um, I don't know what the right word is. It wouldn't be the same for sure as so it was my own humility and acknowledgement of ignorance that that drove me to really study harder. And I think that's true for I think in that is somehow encapsulated what what humility is about. And when you you're talking to someone and they have a different perspective than you do, if you can have the humility to say, I've been wrong before. And perhaps there is something in what this person is saying that I need to open up, open to and listen to and explore. If you don't have humility, if you don't, which i.e., if you don't know, I can be wrong and I have been wrong before. I certainly have that capability. Then you miss out on so much because you're close to it. I say yes and I think where Rabbi Sachs is coming from is there's a level of empathy there also. Is yeah. that Moses, Moses is the leader of the Exodus. That had to, if you were an Israelite, that had to have been a pretty terrifying time because you don't know what you're walking into. You know what, and you know, there's, there's a pretty great midrash which says that only um, one fifth of the Israelites actually left Egypt. Why? Because the other four fifths were too terrified of what that what that uncertain future held to leave. You know what you're getting as a slave. 
It stinks. It's horrible. It's awful. But you know every day what it's going to look like. You don't know what freedom is going to look like outside of it. And that's terrifying. So what do you have? You have a leader who is terrified, who's uncertain, who doesn't know, who's uncertain that he can do any of this. And he, maybe that's why he's the leader of the Exodus, because his own uncertainty, he can be empathetic with that Israelite leadership. And similarly, following Rabbi Sachs's example, Aaron knows the weight and the guilt of sin. Having been the one responsible for the golden calf, he knows what it's like. So who better to do the Yom Kippur ritual and confess sins than somebody who really knows what it's like? And I think that's a little bit where Rabbi Sachs is trying mm. to go, is that you know your insecurities can help make you more empathetic to be able to do the job you're trying to do better because you understand in a deeper way than other people do. Uh, same way that the Talmud says that a, a Baal Tshuva can stand in a higher place than a completely righteous person, right? That somebody who has, somebody who has sinned and done Tshuva and repented and come back stands at a higher level than somebody who's truly righteous because the truly righteous have nowhere to go. They're already great. The Baal Tshuva, somebody who's done Tshuva, is still growing and still has room to go grow higher because they understand what that looks like. But, Barbara, you said yes, but, so I'm waiting for your but. Well, just with respect to what you just said, um, it, I thought that the glass ceiling always lifted or always went higher and higher. So that if you're a naturally righteous person, you still have room to improve. Whereas a Baal Shuba maybe only has to go to a lower ceiling level at the moment and it's more noticeable, but we're not perfect. So there's always room, even for the perfect, to change in a better way. Right, but if you don't make mistakes, if you're if you're perfectly righteous and you never make a mistake, then how do you know how to grow from there? Maybe your problem is that you never make mistakes or don't think you ever <laughs> make mistakes, and you just don't recognize that you never make mistakes. Well, part of the imposter syndrome can be, I mean, there's an evil associated with it. People who have been highly successful and then do their next research project and things are not working out well. Some of these people fabricate data or modify it to because they, they, they're seen as perfect people in their field and they want to do anything that can prevent somebody from knowing their weaknesses. Yeah. I know the answer to that. Tell me. I'm so sorry. I have to go to geology. May I? <laughs> so um, I really don't want to do this if, if it's two minutes that you don't want to spend. But how about the earthquake in Taiwan? 7.4 earthquake on the east coast of Taiwan this week. And how many people were killed? Few. I mean, it's a highly populated country. The um, earthquake was shallow. It was a reverse fault, which means the ground lifted. The shallow earthquake, the more shallow earthquakes are, the more dangerous they are because closer to the surface of the earth, they create more shaking. If it's a deep earthquake, it's a little flat. But the interesting thing about it is why were so few people killed? So we're talking about Taiwan, populated area, high-rise buildings. You've probably seen pictures of high-rise buildings leaning on their sides. And you can do something about it. And what you can do is look for how you make it safer for people that live in these areas. And if, if a geologist or a seismologist in this case says, 
like it would be easy for me to say from the work that I've done, earthquakes are going to happen there every 30 years. Are we going to wipe out thousands of people every 30 years? You look at mainland China, 40 years ago, they had a major earthquake. Maybe, time flies, maybe it's 50 years now since the main earthquake at Tangshan in China. Hundreds of thousands of people were killed. Well, what happened in the meantime to make it so different from Taiwan, also affected by a major fault? And that is better buildings, different building codes, more restrictions. So even if you make mistakes and you're wrong and you are very focused on a particular area, um, I'm trying to think of all the things that Stuart used as his categorizations, there are ways to still work to try to overcome the failure. And so maybe you go into, as I did for years, predicting large late aftershocks. So you have the 7.4, there have already been a dozen aftershocks bigger than five, which is damaging, or a dozen plus by now. And still these large damaging, potentially damaging aftershocks I haven't died. killed people. And it's because I don't know what they learned about the problem and or what they applied in terms of knowledge. I don't have the problem. picture. So something. you're back to overcoming a problem, even though, can we predict earthquakes? No, we're not perfect. We're not able to do it. And I think I've spent like two minutes on the Taiwan earthquake. You can text me afterwards or email afterwards. But for me, that's a that's a problem of science. Science isn't able to do it, much as we think various people know about the Earth's surface or about the areas that are affected by plate tectonics and going to have earthquakes. What you have to do is look for the workaround. So, as the doctor, Stuart, when you're in that five percent where you don't know, don't you still make recommendations? Yes, you have to. Yeah, I mean, they you have to give your opinion. But I think you can always tell people, I'm 80% confident, I'm 50% confident, I'm 95% confident. I mean, if you have good communication, then I think people can accept the fact that you're only half, you know, you're only 50% confident in doing this. And what do we need to do to, to do we need to do anything or what do we need to do to um, improve our diagnosis? Who are you waving at, Rabbi? I was waiting. TK and Laura said they need to go. So uh, just waving to Mike. Um, look, I, I think there's another danger. You know, Stuart, you talked about some dangers in imposter syndrome. I think there's another one, too, though, in which you are so frozen by your feelings of unworthiness that you don't do anything. That you're so frozen by... Um, that five percent chance that you're wrong, that you won't make the you won't make the diagnosis, or you're you know you get so caught up. I think that's a different danger in the imposter syndrome is that we we feel so unworthy. We just feel like we can't do anything at all. And you know, there's a you know one of my teachers said there there's a level at which humility becomes a sin. When you become so humble that you can't, that you feel like you can't, you can't and won't do anything because you're not, you, you're so humble you won't do anything, it becomes a transgression. Um. So, you know, there is some balance in there too, which is where I think Rabbi Sachs comes in also and says, you know, that, um, that wrong page, um. The mystery at the heart of Judaism is not our faith in God. It is God's faith in us. That, you know, we have to we have to believe not only in ourselves, not only in God, but that God believes in us also. And that if God believes in us, then maybe we can move forward to actually do what, what we need to be doing. Yeah, I mean, I, I think we've talked about I don't know what the right word is. Jew Judaism being a doer religion, that we respond to things. And this is, of course, going back to so many uh, problems that the Jews have had over the millennia, Holocaust being the most 
horrible recent one uh, that, you know, was that concept of Jews being just being slaughtered, walking to their area of being slaughtered and not doing anything about it. And if we've learned anything from that is, and that of course could apply to today, what's happening in Gaza, you have to do something, hopefully correctly, do something. You can't just let sit there and, and be paralyzed and do nothing. Yes. You do your best to do it correctly and you learn from the mistakes you make along the way, just like everybody else does. Yes. Um, but, you know, that takes that takes some of what Rabbi Sachs says, too. You, you have to wrestle with it when it happens, too. That those things that make you feel insecure, you need to wrestle with so that you can grow and utilize them for a benefit, too. Even if you're not fully resolved, even if you're not fully at peace with them, you still can use them to your benefit. And continue working which you know, that's a lifelong thing anyways, you know, working on ourselves and trying to be better people. So may we all be able to do it. Yes, Barbara. He said he didn't go, and he, Rabbi Sachs did not discuss what he thought he was going to. What did you think he was going to do? Oh, I thought he was going to do something on Kashrut yeah. because that's in this <laughs> Parsha also, but he didn't, so. I'd like to ask a question. I was mistaken, and uh, you know, I learned not to. Uh, I learned not to uh, assume what Rabbi Sachs is going to talk about. You, <laughs> that's a benefit I grow from that. That's very good. That's very good. He talks about clean, unclean foods. That the issue is to be able to distinguish sacred from profane. You know that kind of thing. Dirty, clean, contaminated, pure, etc. But the. Uh, when the par when the parsha is going through all these laws of kashrut, it talks about um, touching an unclean animal. Suppose I had, you know, like a cheeseburger in here or something. That even if I touch the container, it makes me unclean. But I'm fine by nightfall. Then I get clean again. What about if you actually eat it? Is it the same thing, or is it worse to eat the cheeseburger? I, That's I a more complicated question we might have to tackle another time. But I think the short version is I don't know how you would eat it without touch touching it. it. Touch it first and then eat it. So I think the short version is, you know, somewhat depends on context. Eating it for eating it for eating it is probably the same as touching it, but um You'd be touching it to eat it anyway, unless, you know, you're tying your hands behind your back and going, you know, pie eating style. Um, like if I work in McDonald's and I'm passing out cheeseburgers. Yeah, I don't think I, I'd I have to go back and double check. I don't think the reference is necessarily to cheeseburgers. It's more to like unclean animal carcass. Oh, yeah. So it's more like you you come in contact with a dead lizard for example, or a dead mouse, that's different than, you know, a cheeseburger. Okay, I didn't think about it that way. Yeah, it is. I, that's my I recollection. Know. I'd have to go back and look at it again, but I think no, I, I, that's well, my recollection. Parsha doesn't mention cheeseburgers, but that's <laughs> All right, everybody. Thank you for coming. Thank you for learning together. <laughs> um, I am not going to be here next week. So, uh, but I will send y'all an email and we'll and remind you guys. But um, be well. If I don't see you before then, have a good Shabbat. And uh, looking forward to learning with y'all soon. Am I am I taking next week or are we not meeting next week, folks? We'll meet. Whoever wants to lead can lead, but I'll put that out in email. So. Let me know if I'm not to continue fixing what I was planning to say, folks. Margaret, whoever. Well, there. Be well, everybody. Take care. Thank you, Rabbi.